What's up, Coderbyte? Welcome back to another Data Structures and Algorithms video. I'm still Elizabeth, and I'm still trying to teach you all how to code. Um, today, we're going to be doing another Back to Basics. Uh, we're going to be talking about what is the internet and what are some of the languages we use on the internet. And yeah, I hope you guys are enjoying this series. I think there's a really big need for some of the basics out there on the internet. And um, again, useful for people who never learn this the proper way from start to finish um, or people just getting started. So I hope you all enjoy. Um, as far as some other announcements, I am actually starting a life coaching uh, academy course. Uh, it's gonna be over the next four-ish months. It's run by someone else, another creator on YouTube named Connor McMillan. He's someone I followed for a really long time for various lifestyle tips, how to live a healthier life. And um, something I talked about with him in my initial consultation call to see if it was a good fit was really bringing some of these skills to the engineering world. Um, I think it's a really big struggle for us who spend our days just on the computer talking computer language. Um, so bringing some healthy habits into your day to day, um, how to be mindful, how to step away from your computer, take a walk, take a break, um, how to not self medicate with you know, marijuana or various other things that Adderall that I think, you know, we don't really talk about in this industry, but I've seen across the board with friends, coworkers, all that stuff. So yeah, so get excited for some more of that. I'm really going to try and incorporate it into these videos. And um, that's all for me. Let's get started. Okay, let's get started. Liz presents Coding with Friends. I'm filming this on July 7th, 2023. And um, today we are going to be talking about what is the internet, internet and some HTML basics. Um, so we're gonna go into kind of what is the internet, how does it work in a, in a basic sense, and what are some of the languages that we use on the internet um, to write code and create websites and web applications. So what is the internet anyway? So I, I know in my career, um, I really, uh, I kind of started and I learned the languages and it took me a while to actually figure out what the internet was, despite the fact that I could code, I could create a web page, but I didn't totally get it until, you know, I, I was working in the industry maybe for six months to a year. Um, so if you're at the beginning of your journey, highly recommend you keep following along because this is some important stuff and it can really change who you are as an engineer. So what is the internet? The internet is simply a worldwide system of computer networks in which users can get information or code from other computers. So when we talk about the internet, it's actually just all of our computers talking to each other. Um, computers, servers, these are all kinds of computers. Um, but we're essentially just a network of computers communicating with each other. And that is what the internet is in a very simple terms. Um, a website is usually hosted. Think of this as where the code lives on a server. So a server is simply a special type of computer that is primarily used to store websites, i.e. code that gets sent to your computer to run in your browser. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, when you access a website via URL, what you're doing is you are requesting that code, which lives at that URL. Um, the URL maps to a server address. Um, so you're requesting that code to run on your machine in your browser. A browser is an application that allows you to run code hosted on someone else's machine, i.e. a server or literally someone else's computer. So when you access a website, you have the browser on your machine, right? You have to download the browser, you're using Safari, which comes with your Mac. Um, you have the code that is makes up the browser living on your machine. But when you access a website, you're actually accessing code that is not on your machine. So when you go to google.com, amazon.com, facebook.com, you don't download the code from those websites. It does not live on your computer. You are borrowing that code and it is running in your browser. So your browser makes that possible. This is in contrast to an application you run on your computer where the code lives on your computer rather than on someone else's that you are borrowing when you access a website. So I just said that, but you know, that's good to reiterate that concept. There are various browsers, Google Chrome, Firefox, Safari, etc., which all basically do the same thing, right? They run the code in slightly different ways. Google Chrome is generally considered the best browser as a developer. 
uh, in my humble opinion, because of the developer tools it offers. So as we get more in depth into building a website, learning how to build a website, I will introduce to you some of the uh, developer tools that Google Chrome has. Um, Firefox has since really, you know, uh, leveled up their developer tools over the last few years. But again, I think Google Chrome is generally the gold standard as a developer. Um, okay. So what code actually makes up a website? When you get the code from the server, what is it actually made up of? Um, so websites are made up of a front end and a back end. So what is a front end? A front end focuses on the client facing aspects of a website or a web application, i.e. what the user sees in the browser. This includes designing and optimizing the user interface, i.e. what the user interacts with. So when you go to google.com, the front end is the web page that has the Google logo and the Google search. Building visual aspects of web pages, i.e. what the user sees. Um, and that's essentially what a front end is, right? Again, it's what the user sees, it's what the user's interacting with, it's clicking on things, it's filling out forms, it's searching, you know, using the search toolbar, and it's everything the user sees. So what is the back end? The back end focuses on the server side aspects of a website or web application, i.e. how that special kind of computer, a server, communicates with your browser. So backend code enables the communication between browsers and information from databases often. So what do I mean by that? So when you have an application running on your machine, all the code is on your machine. So anything that you're doing is it's, it's in this little package called an application and everything you're interacting with is self-contained. So you might understand that you don't need an internet connection to run Microsoft Word and use Microsoft Word to its full like capabilities, to write a document, to edit a document, to save a document. That is all self-contained on your machine. You don't need an internet connection for that. This is as opposed to a website where you absolutely need an internet internet connection. Why? Because you're communicating with someone else's computer or a server or whatever. Um, so you get the front end and the front end is running on your browser. Again, that's what you see. And what's happening as the website works, right, as you interact with it, is the front end is sending requests to the back end. So what can what is a request? So you can think of a request as literally asking of something from that server where the where the website is hosted. So when you go visit a URL, that's the first request. You say give me the code, right? That is the initial request. After that, you don't realize cuz you're not making any more requests. But under the hood, what's happening is the code running on your front end in your browser is making requests to the back end. So what do I mean by that? Let's say you fill out a form and you submit that data. What's happening is the website creates a request called a post request. We'll learn about this later on, but it creates a request with that data that you put in that form. Because what, what do you need to do with that data? Ultimately, the server is probably gonna wanna save that data somewhere, AKA a database, right? So when you fill out a form, let's say you're signing up for a website, you are putting in your email address, your password, maybe your address, your phone number, and all of that has to go somewhere. So the front end sends a package of that data to the back end, which then saves that data in a database. Now the database is running on the server, the computer that you are borrowing from. So I hope that kind of clarifies a little bit the basics of how the front end and back end work together in tandem to create a full website. So what is the back end kind of responsible for? It's responsible for the website architecture, which is kind of a general statement that probably a lot of you won't understand, but it's essentially how is the website organized, right? Because obviously there's lots of code. Um, so the back end often is controlling the different folders and components and how the different parts of the website work together to create a full user experience. Um, and communication with databases, i.e. where your data gets stored, like user information, et cetera. So I kind of just talked about that, but when you are looking, when you're adding, you're signing up for a website, that gets stored somewhere. Um, when you order something from Amazon, that order gets stored somewhere. That's how they know to ship something to you. It's not, um, what's the word, ethereal, right? It's not living in the now and now, you know, it, that it, it, um, 
what's the word? It gets, uh, per, it persists. The data will still be there even if you leave the website and come back to it. So that's all happening on the server. Okay. It also manages what gets served to the user when they open your website in their browser. So I'm gonna go into an example of how this exactly works with google.com. So what does the user, user actually see when they go to google.com? Essentially, they are served the Google homepage for the search engine. This is the front end. So when you go to google.com, you see the Google logo, logo and you see the little input bar for your search. That is the front end. When a user types in a search or query, this is sent via a request to the Google backend, which again lives on Google servers, which actually does the search through Google's index storage of the entire internet. So your computer is not doing the search. Their computers are doing the search. All your computer is doing is serving you that input form and ultimately, again, sending those packages of requests to back to their servers, which are actually doing the heavy lifting of searching the internet, which is what Google does. So note, this is a very basic simplification. Obviously, it's much more complex than this, but this is kind of a broad overview of kind of how a website like Google functions. So ultimately, a backend development works together with frontend development to provide users with a functional and interactive experience. So, um, you know, let's bring it back to an engineering career. So I, for example, have uh, historically been called a full stack engineer. What that means is you can think of a stack like the website is a stack and the stack is made up of the front end and the back end. And so a full stack engineer can be responsible for all of these pieces. Mostly I've actually worked heavily on the back end. That's where my expertise lies. However, I know how to use create a front end. It's part of my toolkit. I can create a front end. So my full stack roles have generally been maybe 70% back end, 30% front end. Um, but often in bigger companies, I've worked at smaller startups, um, they, they do kind of separate the front end engineers from the back end engineers. And part of the engineering process is communicating, right? Because whoever's building the front end has to understand the interface of the back end. So they know where do I send this request? What do you want the data to look like? How are you going to read the data from my request? So these are all communications done between the front end engineers and the back end engineers. Um, but like I said, nowadays there are plenty of generalists. Most engineers have expertise in both, um, but you know that's just a little bit of background. So what are some languages used on the front end? So HTML, so most people have heard of this. It stands for Hypertext Markup Language, and it is the standard markup language for documents designed to be displayed in a web browser. So when you get that code from the server to run in your browser, it's gonna be made up of HTML. You can think of this as the scaffolding or building blocks of a website. This is what you use to build the house, aka add a room, add a wall, add an electrical outlet, etc. So again, this is the scaffolding or the building blocks. It's kind of the way the website is structured. CSS is the second language used on the web. So CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheets. We'll talk more about why it's called cascading uh, when we go more in depth into CSS. But uh, CSS is a style sheet language used for describing the presentation of a document written in a markup language, such as HTML. You can think of this as the design of the website. This is what you use to add style to the house, aka paint that room yellow, make the room a certain size, all that sorts of stuff. So I'm using the analogy of a home, but what this actually looks like on a browser is creating containers on the website, right? So again, you think of that Google homepage, there might be a container that contains the Google logo, logo and then another container underneath that, which actually contains the uh, form or the search input. Um, inside that container, you might have an image which represents the Google logo. Inside the other container, you might have an input tab which is the actual, you know, input tag to the uh, search interface. Um, so that would be the HTML's responsibility. The CSS's responsibility might target things like the size of the Google logo or the style of the input. 
you can imagine the back in the day websites, we've all seen them where the inputs and search buttons all look the same, right? They're kind of grayed out, they're boxy, very square. Um, the submits all look the same. They have the same, you know, font. So the CSS might target those elements, those HTML elements and add some styling, make that input have rounded corners. Um, make the button be blue or red, make the font of the submit a certain font, stuff like that. Um, so JavaScript is the third language used on the browser on the web. Um, so JavaScript, often abbreviated as JS, is a programming language that is one of the core technologies of the World Wide, wide Web alongside HTML and CSS. And it is determined, it is used to determine web page behavior and functionality. So what does that mean? JavaScript is used to determine what happens when a user clicks a button or fills out a form, et cetera. It's responsible for making those requests back to the back end, which is on the server, packaging up that data that you put in the form or whatever, and sending it off to the back end. So um, and not only how to package that data, but when to get that data, what happens when you click submit, right? So JavaScript is attached to those various HTML elements and again, reads that information maybe from a form or from something, packages it, packages it up, sends it to the back end. So JavaScript is like the actual brains behind the web um, doing the actual communication. Now you can have a website with just HTML. You can have a website with just HTML and CSS. It won't do anything, right? So if you create a website that's just, you know, a resume and it's just a little bit about you with a picture of you or, you know, some fun facts or projects you've worked on, there's no buttons, there's no nothing. You don't need JavaScript. Um, JavaScript comes into play when you have this interaction uh, between the front end and the back end. Um, and this is what helps us to create web applications, code that you can actually do something with versus a web page, a simple web page. Now, even just a simple web page built with HTML and CSS does have communication with the server, right? Because when you visit that URL, you still have to make that initial request to the server, give me the HTML and CSS to create the web page. But once it's loaded on your machine and you're scrolling through it, blah, 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 there's no, there's no more requests being made to the server because you already have all that there is to see. Um, again, that might be considered more of a web page versus a web application. So tools to use to build your first web page. So a lot of people get tripped up because it is complicated to use a text editor, which again, we talked about in the first video. If you haven't watched that, highly recommend you return to that and watch that. Um, it's, it's a little tricky and complex at the beginning of your journey to write your code in a text editor and figure out how do I see it in a browser, right? So there are all sorts of tools that you can do it all within a website um, and you can type your HTML, CSS and JavaScript and it will just show what that would look like in a website. So you would not use this kind of tool to actually build a website, but while you're learning and playing around, you can use these tools to quickly see, oh, I put a uh, container element and I styled it with a background of a color red, and then I made a button. And when I click the button, I wanna alert something to the user. You can do all of that in these tools and see it live. You know, It will just reload every time you make a change. And it's a very, very useful tool to play around with. So I suggest using something called codepen.io. It's a great interface. So it's free. It's a website where you can write HTML, CSS, and JavaScript and see the results displayed. Um, so this is kind of what it looks like. So here, um, and we're going to go into what all of these kind of uh, keywords mean. Um, but here I have my HTML. Here I have my CSS. Here I have my JavaScript. And here underneath it, I have exactly what that HTML, CSS, and JavaScript would look like on a website. So you can see here I have a div, which is a container element. Maybe it stands for divider, I'm not sure, but it's called a div element. And in JavaScript, um, an element tag, that's what it's called, is denoted by the uh, less than sign and the greater than sign at the beginning, and then the less than sign and the greater than sign to end the tag 
and that is denoted by that forward slash. So this is the start tag, this is the end tag. So here I have a div, which is again, just a container. Um, and I have an H1, which stands for header. There are six levels of headers. H1 is the biggest, H6 is the smallest. And I have hello world, which is just the text I'd like to show in the header. Um, underneath it, I have a button and I have an ID on that. We'll talk more about why you would use an ID. Um, but basically, as a preview, you'd use an ID to target a specific button. So if I had multiple buttons on the page and I wanted one to be blue and one to be red, I could have different IDs and then target those specific IDs in my CSS or JavaScript um, so that when I click one button, it doesn't think I'm clicking another button. So here I have a button. Inside that button tag, I have click me, which is just the text on the button. And that's it for my HTML. So let's walk into the CSS here. So here I have CSS um, and the uh, syntax for CSS is you write the tag that you're targeting and you have an open and closed curly brace and inside of the open and closed curly brace, you write your rules, your CSS rules. So here I am targeting my H1 tag and I'm setting its color to orange. So you can see here I have um, an orange hello world. Here I'm targeting my button and I set its width and height. Now width and height, you can do various uh, measurement, um, you know, uh, whatever it's called, uh, measurements. Um, here I'm using pixels, which is PX. So I want my button to be 200 pixels long and 50 pixels high. Um, here I set my uh, div, um, my div uh, styling. I give it a border. So the border is two pixels wide. It's solid and it's red. So you can see that, that this entire container is now surrounded by a red border. You can do a dashed border, you can do all sorts of things. This is really endless. And in order to learn all this, you gotta play around with it. You gotta look stuff up because I'm not gonna be able to teach everything to you. But this is essentially what this does. And here in my JavaScript, I'm doing something very basic. Um, so in order to interact with the document, you can use what's called vanilla JavaScript, which is no library. It's just naked acting, interacting with the browser, or you can use a library to help interact with what's happening on the web page um, and make it a little bit cleaner, easier to reason about, easier to read. So here I'm using something called jQuery. jQuery is, I believe, I assume stands for JavaScript query. Um, and it's essentially a way to interact with your HTML. So I import that to be able to use it. And then you use this dollar sign to denote I am doing a jQuery query. So here I query for my button and you see my button, this hashtag says, this is an ID. Look for the ID that says my button. So here you see, I set this ID on my button to my button. So here I capture that. And then I add what's called a click event. So I add the click event to it and I say, run this code when you click the button. So I pass it a function, which you can, I don't think we went over this last week, but we'll go over it in future videos. A function is just a wrapper around a certain amount of code that you want to run. So you might have a function for what happens when you click a button. You might have a function for what happens when you submit a form. So this is again a way kind of just to organize your code, um, run all of these things on this event, that sort of thing. So here I pass in this function. Um, again, when I click the button that I capture a reference to with jQuery, and what do I do? I send an alert to the user and I say, you click the button. So let's see this live. So here you see the code pen interface looks exactly like the screenshot I had in the slides. I have my HTML, my CSS, and my JavaScript. So let's go through this briefly. So the HTML elements, that's what each thing is called, um, is denoted by the uh, less than and greater than sign uh, surrounding the tag name. So here we have a div. Um, div might stand for divider, I'm not sure, but it's essentially, you can think of it as a container. Um, and the uh, beginning of the tag, it looks like this, and the end of a tag has a forward slash. So all of these elements inside of the div are nested inside of the div. So you can see the end of the tag is, you know, the beginning and end of the container. Um, these two elements, my button and my header, are within the container. So here I have an H1 tag. H1 is a header tag. 
Uh, there are six levels of headers, so H1 through H6. H1 is the biggest header, I think, and H6 is the smallest header. Um, and um, I basically just write the text that I want the header to be, which I wrote, hello world. Um, underneath it, I have a button. This is the button tag, and it just has text on top of it, which says click me. So that's this button right here. Now you can see I actually set an ID on this button. The ID is my button. So an ID is for targeting a specific element on the page with CSS or JavaScript. So you can imagine you might have multiple buttons on your page and you don't wanna target every button. You might wanna have one button be blue and one button be red. So you would target a specific button using its ID. So we'll talk more about that in future videos. So let's hop to the CSS. So here I have some CSS and the syntax for CSS is the tag name and the ID if you're targeting a specific uh, element. In this case, the way I'm using this uh, uh, targeting is I target every H1 on the page. So if I had multiple H1s, they would all have the color orange. In this case, we just have the one, but that I want you to understand that delineation. So here I set the color to orange. Here you can see my header is now orange. I target the button and I target its width and height. So I set its width to be 200 pixels wide. Um, that's a measurement. There are multiple ways to measure things on the web, um, but using pixels is a classic way. So it's 200 pixels wide and the height is 50 pixels high. I then target the div and I give it a border. So I say, I want there to be a border around my container. And that is a useful tool for developing because if you add some borders, you can see where is this container on the page? How big is it? How much space does it take up? And generally divs will take, it will be the height and width of all of its elements that it has inside of it. So you can see following this border that it basically surrounds the H1 and button, which are inside of it. If there was nothing inside of it, it would be smaller. If there were more things inside of it, it would be bigger. So I set a border to it. I set the border to be two pixels wide, solid, and red. So you can do things like a dashed border or a blue border or whatever. Um, so that's the syntax there. Um, then let's hop to the JavaScript. So the first line is importing a library called jQuery. So what is jQuery? When you use JavaScript to interact with the HTML and CSS, you can just use what's called vanilla JavaScript, which is JavaScript with no library. There's no additional features to it. Um, however, it's easier to use a library called jQuery, which has a little simpler syntax. Um, it helps you kind of make modules in your code, so it's not a lot of mess. Um, it helps organize things. It's just, you know, I could show you here the comparison of what doing this would look like in vanilla JavaScript versus doing it with jQuery. I'm not going to, but take my word for it. Um, so here I'm importing jQuery so that I can use it. And then you use a dollar sign to actually use the library. So all I'm doing is I am targeting my button. And how am I doing that? I am targeting it, targeting it by ID. So the hash symbol uh, signifies that this is an ID it's looking for, and I pass it the my button ID, which matches the ID that I set on the button. So that's how I capture the, the button. After I capture it, I add what's called a click event to it. So this is what is going to happen when I click the button. If I did not have this code, you could click the button, nothing is gonna happen. So this is what sets up the relationship between the button clicking it and the action that happens when you click it. So here I pass in a function, which we haven't talked about yet, but a function is just a wrapper around specific code you wanna run. So I want to run this function when I click the button and inside the function, I might do various things. I might send an alert. I might make a request to the server. I might scroll the page. I don't know, you could you know, fill the function with infinite things, but all of those things will happen when you click the button. So here, all I do is I alert the user and I say, hello, CoderByte family. So we'll see that in action. I'm going to click the button. An alert is something that is in the JavaScript library language, whatever. Um, and all that does is when you click the button, you get a little alert. 
and it says, hello, Coder Byte family, which is what I wanted it to. And you have to dismiss it with the OK button. There we go. So let's make some changes here. Let's say you clicked the button. And you'll see um, CodePen automatically reloads the page. You click the button now, and I have a new text. It says you click the button. So let's do a few more things. Let's maybe add something called a paragraph tag. So a paragraph tag is just a container for words. So let's say, hello, CB family. I'm Elizabeth and I'm filming a video. So you can see code pen um, kind of automatically reloads the page and here's my paragraph tag. So something I want you to notice is that the div extended its bounds to capture that paragraph tag. Now what happens if we put, let's say in H3, so let's say this is going to be again a smaller header and we put it under the div. So let's say this is in H3. So that will happen outside of the div because it's not nested within it. Um, and again, so you see it's a, still a header, so it has some bolding, but it's a little smaller than the H1. And it's white because we're not targeting this with CSS. So let's target this H3 with some CSS and let's set its color to blue. And now we have a blue H3 tag. Now let's make another H1 tag. This is another H1 tag. And now we see when we have the H1 tag, the second H1 tag, let's scroll a little bit. This is orange, like our first one, because we are targeting it. We target every H1 on the page. Um, so um, we can set an ID on this, say um, my custom H1. And if we want this one to not be orange, what we can do is we could say H1 and then that hash, and we can say my custom high, and we can say this one we want to be red. Let's see if that works. That's not the syntax. Let me look up the syntax. CSS ID targeting. See, I have to look up everything as well. So this is called a CSS selector, um, and the CSS selector is ah, like this. So let's um, go back to my, uh, so we don't have to put the H1 in there. So here I target my My Custom High and I make the color red and it is not working because it's not high, it's H1. Um, and here we have a red H1. So here we have two H1s, we target all of them with orange, and then we specifically target this one as red. Now let's have another H1 tag, a new one. And this one is going to be orange because we have said that all H1s should be orange, except for this one, which is red. And that's what's meant by cascading. A cascading style sheet is something that affects things at various levels in different ways at different times. And you'll also learn that the ordering of the, H of the CSS matters. So if you target something with more specificity, so this has more specificity than this because this targets all H1s, this targets something more specific, um, all of these things cascade to make the final result. So this is a whole topic all on its own. I'm terrible at CSS, but it's very complex, the ways in which you organize your CSS, how you understand how all the styles are cooperating with each other in order to create the end result. But don't worry about that for now. Just kind of uh, do some research. I can't teach you all the elements and the CSS language. Um, so you should play around with all this stuff look stuff up um, and just see what's out there. Because again, you saw I just had to look something up. I look up everything. You're not gonna memorize it all. Okay, so back to the slides. Um, so I just kind of added some uh, little notes for you guys to see. I just explained all of this, but I explain again what a div tag is, what an H1 tag is, etc. Here I uh, kind of talk about what I'm doing in the CSS. And finally, here I talk about um, what I'm doing with the JavaScript. So in case you miss that or you're a more textual based learner, here I have some notes for exactly how this HTML, CSS and JavaScript are working together. So what are some commonly used HTML elements? Again, these are like a few out of a million. 
So uh, I highly suggest you play around on CodePen. Uh, you look up a list of HTML elements and play around. See what do they look like? How do they work? Um, so we already talked about um, divs, but this is uh, some more tags. So a body tag. This represents the content of an HTML document, and there can only be one such element in a document. So you might see a document, and it is all surrounded by a body tag. So everything on the page is within the body tag, just like we had elements within the div tag. HTML is all about nesting, right? You have one element, and you have other elements inside, and you have other elements inside that, etc. So if you have a body tag, everything else on the page is going to be within that body tag, and you just have one body tag. You can't have multiple body tags, and it represents the entire document. Divs, this is the generic container for content. We talked about this. H1, talked about this as well. There are six levels of headers, H1 to H6, and each is a slightly different size. Um, we have P tags, which represent paragraphs. We have buttons, which is an interactive element activated by a user with a mouse or keyboard. Once activated, it then, then performs an action, such as submitting a form or opening a dialogue or all sorts of other things. Um, a form do uh, element is represents a document section containing interactive controls for, for submitting information. So a form might be made up of inputs, buttons, calendar pop-ups, you know, you've all filled out forms on the internet. So a form would be the outer container, and inside of it would be the elements of the form itself. We also have something called a UL, which represents an unordered list of items, which is typically rendered as a bulleted list and an OL, which represents an ordered list of items, typically rendered as a numbered list. And then we have LIs, which are list items. Um, these are within the UL or the OL, and uh, this represents the items of the list. So it must be contained in a parent element, either an ordered list or an unordered list. So again, you'd have the UL, and inside of it nested would be the LIs. And then each LI would get a bullet point. That's a bulleted list. So here I have a link to the HTML elements reference guide. I believe I linked the Mozilla one, might be the W3 one. These are both uh, very uh, classic websites that list all sorts of things about coding. Um, click on it, look through it, play around with it on CodePen. So here are some CSS basics. We already went over a lot of this. But using CSS, we can target HTML elements and make them look a certain way, such as making a text a certain color or font, making an element a certain size, adding borders and shadows, etc. The CSS syntax is as follows. Um, so here you have the, uh, you know, targeting the element, and then you have the rules for that element. So here I have a little bit of CSS that I wrote in my text editor with some comments to kind of walk you through what each thing is doing. So here I have a comment that says the HTML element tag name followed by curly braces and the CSS rules coincide the curly braces. So here we have a div, we're targeting it. We set the width of the div in pixels. We set the height of the div in pixels. We set the background color of the div, set the border thickness type and color of the div. And then we have a P where we set the font family. We set it to Times New Roman, Times, and Serif. So this is just setting the font family of the, of the P tag, the paragraph tag. And then you would have to look up why do you have all three of these things. It has to do with the font family and the specific font and whether it's Serif or Sans Serif, you know, all that fun stuff. So look it up. Um, I don't know. Again, not a CSS expert over here. So what is your homework for this week? Homework is play around on codepen.io with some HTML and CSS. And if you're feeling really adventurous, some JavaScript. Again, it's relatively simple, some of the JavaScript. It can be infinitely complex, but there are some simple things that you can do with buttons specifically. Um, look stuff up, play around. You can't mess up anything. It's just a code pen, and it's a lot of fun. So uh, thanks for coming, and see you all next week.